first things first, we need to thank all of our corporate sponsors. Um, as everybody has noticed, Extraction, Horizon, Crestone Peak, Enduring, TPG. Um, and please, to reiterate, DRW is not a sponsor. You don't see a Hot Take of the Day logo here. Discovery, Carlton, North Star, Nationwide Airship, all thank you very much for making this possible. I mean, I suppose DRW is making it possible as well. Um, and then upcoming, really not that much to mention because um, life was canceled on or around March 13th. And um, we're trying to get back up and running. What we do have, though, is a couple more webinars, of course, socially distanced. We have July 22nd, we have Dick Massimilian, and then we have Anna Conrad coming up in August. So please stay tuned. We're going to keep adding topics. Um, and we hope it helps everybody work on ourselves while we have lots of time to work on ourselves. So without further ado, I will turn over to Control to the one and only. Um, man, so, so we have a lot to go over today. Uh, so I'm gonna do my best to stay within the hour and be respectful of people's times. Um, Let's start with the first slide, and, and just I get I get asked a lot, especially as as our industry is going through transformative change, and that people are leaving the industry and layoffs are occurring. I get a lot of notes saying, "Should I go back to school and get an MBA?" And um, I understand the driver totally. And so for each person, I want to say it depends. And the answer you're always going to learn in business school is the answer is always it depends. But for me, the the biggest takeaways that I had from the MBA program were that number one, it's a tour of the library. And we're gonna do a, a quick tour together in the library. And I'm gonna show you some of the resources and some of the, the topics and some of the things that really were impactful for me on my career. I was very blessed that Anadarko uh, sponsored my MBA. I did an executive MBA through uh, Queen's University in Canada and Cornell University, which is why I have two MBAs. I did that while I was working, while I was living in Calgary, commuting to Denver, and I did, uh, work all, the, all week, school all day Saturday, and spent about seven hours with my family on Sunday, which is why the book sort of describes the journey of uh, when I prioritized my career and prioritized my MBA and prioritized everything that wasn't family, what happened in February 1st, 2012, in the next 18 months. But for me, a lot of the resources that you that we're going to talk about today are out there. And so if you have a curiosity for learning, you can cover a lot of the MBA material on your own. And so then the second question is, what about the accreditation? Um, is it important? Yes, it can be. But I would say if you're going to do it a full-time MBA versus a part-time MBA, where you're on campus, you're building relationships with 70 or 80 people that are in a different industry um, and that work in different cities and that are now your contacts for maybe pivoting. So you might meet a, a retail C senior VP who happens to work for so-and-so. and meeting them and spending time with them, which is what we're going to talk about on the team building, is really important. An executive MBA just for accreditation, doing things like this, reading books, reading probably the best book on Amazon right there. Um, no, just kidding. It's not the best book. It's probably third best. Um, but reading that is, is you can really progress yourself for yourself. And so you need to consider the trade-offs. It is an investment of time and roughly $100,000. And you need to understand for that investment of $100,000 after tax, which is $150,000 before tax, are you going to get a commensurate rate of return or would you do better to put that $100,000 in a short ETF that shorts the energy sector and oil and gas and you make money as the sector collapses? Um, those are your choices to make, but that's sort of a view. And then the final thing is um, my favorite course is strategy. And so we're going to start with strategy. Here's where I said, if you have your pen and paper handy, there's something that, that um, from a strategy standpoint that sometimes people miss, and I'll go forward one slide. There's a difference between the goal of an organization, the strategy of an organization, and the tactics. I think that sometimes they get blended and blurred, like you know, drilling wells is a tactic, as an example. A strategy might be to uh, develop 
in the fastest way possible. And there's a company that's Elliott Management backed uh, in the Midland Basin called Birch Resources. You may have heard of them. They have approximately 20,000 acres. And their strategy was to apply five rigs at the, through 2019 and 2020 and drill all of their inventory as fast as they possibly could, complete all of it as fast as they possibly could, and then let it go on decline and sell the cash flow. So the tactic was drill wells as operationally efficient as they could and for the lowest cost possible. The strategy was to drill all their inventory and sell the cash flow, not the inventory. And the goal was to make an economic rate of return. And so strategy was probably the most interesting course that I learned in the MBA. And as I talk about that, the, the key resource that I would point you to is called Porter's Five Forces. And so a lot of you might've heard of SWOT analysis, which is the strengths, opportunities, weaknesses, and threats. Um, strengths, opportunities, Strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, threats, SWAT. I can, I can convert that. Um, but I don't think that that really explains where you sit in a business model as to why something might be a good business, why it might be a bad business. Warren Buffett talks a lot about there being a moat. And so if you build an island with a moat, the moat is your defense mechanism. Defense mechanisms can be patents. They can be very, very high barriers of entry, like regulatory hurdles. Um, in oil and gas, you could argue that capital was the barrier of entry. But in about 1977, I think, is about is when uh, Porter, Michael Porter, came out with the five forces. And so I'm going to talk about them and then put them in context. And so I might get you to write down on your pen and paper uh, when we do a little analysis on oil and gas to see why has oil and gas been historically such a horrible business in terms of making returns for investors. And I want to really focus on that because I get some feedback on the hot take of the day that's like, you know, David, you really hate the industry and you really beat us up and why don't you be positive? I'm not beating up the industry. There is no doubt fossil fuels are the single most important um, source of driving the world economy. But there is a difference between the fact that we need oil and gas to live and that companies are supposed to make profit for investors. And that is the core reason they exist. So Porter's five forces. Let's start on the horizontal axis. On the left, you see there's a threat of new entrants. And so you can, you can break this up a little bit um, in oil and gas and think about private equity firms are new entrants. But, but broadly speaking, if you're in the Permian, are you going to see a huge number of people come in, large companies, huge capital now versus maybe 2016 in the last downturn and maybe 2014 when oil was at the peak? So the threat of new entrants really speaks to what is the competitive dynamic of new companies? And for our industry, it's always been private equity. You have the big companies that have sort of work through their plans over 15, 20, 25 years. And the private equity companies that would go to limited partnerships, LPs, they would raise money and they would very quickly deploy huge amounts of money to try and create an economic return. So one of the things that made our industry very difficult was that if there was price dislocation and the Permian acreage was trading at 3,000 an acre, private equity would pour billions of dollars and they would drive that price from 3,000 an acre to 25,000 an acre. And so the, the cost of entry raised. And so the threat of new entrants in oil and gas is very high. So I would, I would ask you now, as I'll take a pause, think about ancillary businesses or, or oil and gas. What other new entrants can come in and impact your profitability? Because all this is about profitability. So that's one of the reasons oil and gas bids the top. Now, let's go to the other side of the horizontal axis, which is on the one side, so the horizontal vertical is, there's a threat of new people coming to take your profit, and then there's a threat of your product no longer being relevant. And so that's the threat of substitutes. And certainly in the last four years, and, and much, much more so in the last two years, the threat of substitutes, and in particular, where coal was destroyed, let's call it what it is, by Aubrey McLennan in 2006. And in 2001, 2002, natural gas was short in North America. The US was very worried. 
and we were having Senate hearings. And Aubrey realized that there was a lot of gas, but it was going to take eight, 10, 12, 15 dollars in MCF to get it out. This was before fracking, before horizontal wells. This was the beginning. And so he pushed the environmental narrative in 2006 that really was one of the driving factors to dislocate coal as the primary source of our electricity generation. So for coal, the threat of substitutes was in 2010, coal did 45% of the natural of the electricity generation in the entire world or in, in North America. And by 2020, it's down to 25%. And all of that share has been taken up by natural gas, wind, and solar. And so when you look at now and you look at COVID and you look at the state of the world and the environmental movement, the threat of substitutes to oil and gas is that um, if prices go too high, you can convert to different fuels. If uh, wind and solar continue to get funding and get subsidies and get capital because it's the new sexy thing that has new patents and people can create a billion dollar business from that, you're gonna have competitive forces that are driving down demand for your product while creating demand for theirs. So as we sit in 2020, one of the biggest differences in our industry is the threat of substitution is very high. So from a competitive forces, you have the threat of new entrants, you have the threat of substitution, and then internal, you have existing players and how do they interplay? And what kind of level of competition do they have? And I think Coke and Pepsi, you know, whenever Coke does something, Pepsi might respond. So Coke, uh, Pepsi did that taste test challenge. Everyone remembers that they're old enough to remember in the 90s. And, you know, Coke then came out that said nothing tastes like a Coke. And so these within industry, companies who have a pseudo differentiated product are always fighting to make it so that their product is more important. Those are the horizontal axes that create the business dynamics for what you should be considering in terms of strategy. It's also what makes oil and gas so difficult because the threat of new entrants is extremely high. There's lots of capital available historically. Our industry is very capital intense and private equity was able to deploy a tremendous amount of capital to be able to undercut existing players from moving quickly. In terms of threat of substitutes, wind and solar in particular have reduced the apparent demand for oil and natural gas and that there's now a stigma associated with oil and gas so that there's always going to be a pricing factor that's factored in. And then on the industry rivalry, the thing that makes it not competitive is there isn't just Exxon buying the private equity people however they want to. There's 400 public companies and there's 1,000 private equity companies. And so the highest fool, the highest paying fool will always end up with the asset. And so because there's so much competition in North America, to develop resources, to buy resources, to pay for resources. We really are very weak on the horizontal axis. Now, let's think about the verticals. There's two verticals. There's the bargain power of the suppliers. And so in this case, you can think service companies, but, but also think um, suppliers of energy. And so the US and Canada, but the US in this case, we are a whole bunch of fragmented, very, very small companies that are competing against national governments. The government of Saudi Arabia controls 99% of the stock of Saudi Aramco. Saudi Aramco is the only company that can compete in Saudi Arabia. They can develop at their own pace. They can manage the regulations however they want to. And so the interplay of government versus company is very, very different. And that's why when we see these swings, the US is as, as free market as you can get. Below 50, we don't make money. Above 50, we pour as much capital as we possibly can to create supply. But we are competing with the national oil companies of China, of Russia, of Nigeria, of Venezuela, of Libya, of Saudi Arabia. And so from a bargaining power, we create a non-unique product that we sell on the open market at the lowest marginal cost. So from the bargaining power of suppliers, it's a very, very difficult industry to, to be in because we're totally at the whim of OPEC. And obviously we saw that when the demand destruction happened in March with COVID and the shutdowns, OPEC uh, raised production and in particular Saudi 
and oil went from 50-ish to negative 37 a barrel. So for the bar bargaining power of suppliers, there isn't a lot there. And then the bargaining power of buyers, does a buyer really care if they go to Exxon for their oil or Shell or Sinclair or Conoco? No, we just go buy our gas because it's totally ubiquitous, it's totally cheap. And so there's no marketing. Like when you think about the dollars that Apple invests or Nike invests to build their brand, Nike is selling $2 shirts made in Asia for $57 because of the swoosh. Now, I'm selling hot take of the day, hope is not a plan t-shirts that cost approximately $10, but the logo, the branding is usually negative. So you can usually buy the shirts at a much cheaper price than they cost to make. Unlike Nike who, and the reason that this whole, and again, I'm not gonna get political, but when you think about Black Lives Matter and you think about Starbucks in particular, Starbucks has a whole bunch of customers across a whole diverse range and they have all the data on spending, demographics, everything. And they said, on mass, we will lose more customers if we don't let our employees wear Black Lives Matter t-shirts than we will if we impose anti-Black Lives Matter policy where you can't wear the clothing will lose revenue because our customers will go away. And so they're looking at Porter's five forces every day to figure out how they're gonna balance their public narrative of Black Lives Matter versus profitability, which is the only reason that companies exist. And so for me, and there's lots more reading you can do on this subject, and obviously I said we would do 15 minutes per subject, so we're at the end of strategy. But Porter's five forces, whenever you're looking at a business, think about who can come and disrupt you, what products will disrupt you, what pricing power do you truly have, what control over the suppliers do you have, and then what differentiates you from everybody else. Those are the five forces that impact strategy and that impact profitability. And you know, the, the, none, the, none of this is gonna come as a surprise, but oil and gas for the last 20 years has made something like 3%. We're not differentiated product. We're at the whim of the market in terms of commodities. We're seeing more substitutes. There's infinite number of new entrants that can come in and buy. And the industry rivalry is it's very competitive and competitive markets erode profitability. The reason that all of the companies and all of the, the billion billionaires are as rich as they are. Facebook was really the first social media platform, Mark Zuckerberg, billionaire. Tesla was really the first person pushing an electric vehicle and batteries and solar and disrupting, billionaire. Bill Gates, Microsoft totally controlled the market. If you remember, there was an antitrust case because they were crushing Net, uh, Netscape with Internet Explorer and not allowing people on it, crushed it. Apple, their phone, their app store, their platform is totally locked down billionaire. And so monopolies, and in particular, being able to create a brand are how billionaires are created. And oil and gas, unfortunately, unless the commodity price goes up, none of the forces really work. So that strategy, if there's anything else you want to reach out, you can always reach out to me at drw.hottakeoftheday.com. We can have lots of chats about this. I love this. It was my favorite topic in the NBA. Um, so with that, let's move to the financial statement. Now, this is the first time we're gonna do an interactive, we're gonna stop listening to me talk. I'm gonna have a little drink of coffee. You can imagine it is definitely coffee. And I want you to go to the top of the chat. There is, uh, I said, don't look yet, but here's a fun exercise coming. Now I want you to open, because the, the refresh rate on the video is very slow. I want you to open this video and it's about a, 30 second watch, and here's the exercise. You can see the SNP. You have to count the number of passes that are done with the ball between the people in the white shirt. So it's very important that you count the number of passes, and then we're gonna do a poll to see how many people got the right number. So I'm gonna take about a one and a half minute break. Stop the video when it says, how many passes did you count? Click on the link, I'll do it too, and then we can go from there.
Hopefully everyone got a chance to see that. If you didn't, um, I'll encourage you to watch it at some other point. Um, but I want you to go to the polls. I want you to answer the question. And you're going to see that there is another answer there that we're going to talk about in a second. Okay, so the point of the video, um, for those who, who saw it, there is a gorilla that comes across the screen. It walks from the right side of the screen to the left. So for 20 seconds, go back in the video, press play, and some of you may not have seen the gorilla. And I'm gonna talk about this because it's important as we think about financial statements. So press play on your video, have a look, and sure enough, a man dressed as a gorilla walked through the middle of that screen. Hey, okay. sharing the poll now. How many just just for how many saw the gorilla? Let's just just do a a, a shakeout. That's great. Cool. So roughly 75% saw the gorilla, 25% didn't see the gorilla. And for those, when I did this exercise in my MBA, I will tell you, I didn't see the gorilla. And the takeaway as we think about the financial statement is if you are so focused on doing the task at hand and looking for data and looking for something that's supporting your case, and you're not reading the full scope of what you're seeing, you can sometimes miss the big picture even if it's right in front of your face. Um, I think about COVID in this way a little bit in that depending on what your bias is, and I don't really care what your bias is, but I promise you when you're reading news articles, you're likely not going back to the entire data source and you're not rebuilding your entire framework of analysis every single time you do it. You're looking for, ah, Arizona spiking. I knew it, we should never have opened the economy. That's exactly why Doug Ducey's a horrible governor. You're horrible. But for those like me, I would say, well, Arizona was only 9,800 cases. Now it was 5,000 cases before. New York City got to 20,000 cases per million. So it stands to reason that the state has to increase in terms of infection levels. And more importantly, we're testing younger people now because we have access to tests. So cases are going up, but deaths are going down. And so whenever I read a news article, I see the cases going up, deaths going down. And when someone else is saying the response was wrong, they're seeing it. So the gorilla is a really good just analogy to think. Sometimes you always need to reset your premise, take a step back and think what in the hell is going on. So if we go to the next slide with that in mind, I wanna talk about financial statements, which are literally the, the most boring thing in history until you finally understand them. And for engineers, I'm gonna sell you on why financial statements are awesome. They always have to balance by definition. So for example, let's talk about the balance sheet. The balance sheet is a snapshot of the financial state of a company on a day. So that's why when you're looking at financial statements, it'll say, but it balance sheet at December 31st, 2019. That means on that day, here is a snapshot of the assets and the liabilities. And like it's a balance sheet, assets equal liabilities plus shareholder equity. And so if the liabilities are a billion and the assets are two billion, that by definition means the shareholder equity is a billion dollars and you've created above an accounting asset a billion dollars to value. We're gonna talk about Chesapeake. And so again, I'll ask you to go, I think to the handouts, there's something called the uh, Chesapeake filings. And um, I'm gonna get you to go through there. And, and in particular, we're just gonna walk very quickly through financial statements, because there's a couple things that I think are, are really important and relevant, even for very basic like financial literacy. I cannot, state strongly enough that the single most important part of a company is the financial statement. I don't read any investor presentations because they're all bullshit. 
And the reason you know they're bullshit is because the first slide in their presentation says forward-looking statements. And it says that none of this shall be construed as this, that, or the other heretofore. A lawyer wrote it. It's very long. And it basically says everything we're saying is bullshit. Look at our financial statements. So in the financial statements, there's the balance sheet, which we talked about. There's the income statement, which is the flow. So between time period A and time period B, what flows happened? What revenue did we generate? What costs did we have? What expenses did we incur? What interest, what G&A? How does that all reconcile? But the important thing to know about an income statement is something like depreciation. And we can talk about that, but depreciation is very clearly a non-cash charge. And so what makes oil and gas financial statements very interesting is the asset that goes on the balance sheet is not the reserves. If I spend a billion dollars drilling wells, the asset on my balance sheet is a billion dollars. The reserves only play in on the balance sheet based on depreciation. And so if I produce 40% of my reserves in the first year, then my depreciation would be 40% of the original cost I spent on the wells. So whether it was a dry, not a dry hole, whether it was a really, really bad well or a phenomenal well worth 10 times the amount of money, the balance sheet says absolutely zero about the actual value of the company. What it says everything about is how much historical capital have you put into the business? And then how much have you depreciated that? And the net is this artificial number. On the income statement, it shows up. But on the cash flow statement, that is all about cash. And so we're going to spend more time on the cash flow statement because it's the single most important thing in oil and gas. An old friend, uh, when I was in Canada, she was the VP of land. The joke was always um, cash is king, but land expires. So land is more important. And for those uh, petroleum landmen out there, I know you see the, the, the humor in that. But for those who own stock price uh, shares in oil and gas companies, I think that the pain you're feeling is because simply the cash flows have never been there. So, and then the most, 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 most important part of any financial statement is the notes. And they sub tag, they sub comment every one of the pieces. So if there's something, something weird going on, because the balance sheet or the income statement only represents a line and it's a number but the notes then explain exactly what's going on. And so if you don't read the notes, you shouldn't even read the financial statements. And if you don't read the financial statements, you shouldn't own the company. So um, last thing before we switch to actually looking at the data, uh, cash flow from operations plus the cash flow from investing plus the cash flow from financing equals the change in cash. So like the balance sheet that assets equal liabilities plus shareholder equity, everything in these statements balance. So accounting is kind of like engineering, except it's just a lot easier. That's pretty funny, right? Anyone going with me? No. Okay. Um, let's get to the next slide. So I want you to skip to slide, uh, sorry, page in your Chesapeake filing. I want you to go to page 67 out of 204. So I'll give you 10 seconds. Again, we're not gonna we're not gonna go in extreme detail here. But first thing, they wrote 66 pages of management discussion and analysis before they got to the actual thing that details the, the, the financial position. So we're looking at Chesapeake, obviously. They declared bankruptcy last week. We'll talk a little bit about that. But the first page, page 67, talks about the current assets. I'm gonna whip through these, but cash. I mean, that's obvious. Accounts receivable. So these would be all of the revenue that they have accrued for that they have not yet received in terms of oil and gas. There's a whole bunch of other things in there. And so accountants on here will say, well, it's this and that. But broadly speaking, it's things for which you have not yet been paid, but you believe you will be paid. Short-term derivative assets are very similar. That would be like um, hedges or whatever that are going to come due in the next 12 months that you may not have been paid. The important thing on these statements is short term is anything less than 12 months, long term is anything longer than 12 months. So you sum up the total current assets of Chesapeake were $1.2 billion. This proved oil and gas properties. This is not the value of their property. We're going to talk about where that is, but this is simply 
they have spent $30.8 billion on assets plus 2.2, 2.173 incremental and unproved, and then 1.8 in other. So their total property and equipment at cost, they've spent $34 billion to develop it. And over the course of time, they depreciated $20 billion. So what it says is the cost net of depreciation is $14 billion, 14.7. That's the assets, okay? Now we go to liabilities, which is page 98. Accounts payable, similar to receivable. There are things that you know you have to pay, but you haven't. You have current maturities, which are debt that is owed within the next 12 months. This is typically the thing that causes companies to go bankrupt, is when you don't have $385 million to pay the maturity of the bonds when they come due, you're now in default. And so you opt into a restructuring agreement of which one of them is chapter 11. Short-term liabilities, other liabilities. And so this is where other liabilities, you're like, what is that? Read the financial notes. Now, long-term liabilities, 9 billion in long-term liabilities. Uh, you have long-term derivative in, in, um, instruments, asset retirement obligation, which is a, a very, 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 very low estimate of the actual cost of abandoning all your wells, as everybody knows. Orphan wells are probably the single biggest issue our industry is gonna face over the next five to 10 years. And so their total liabilities are 9.4 billion. Um, the additional paid in capital is a good line um, in the equity. That's the total amount of cash that they raised in equity. So by definition, do you have to balance that out, which is why you have a deficit and why the total equity, even though they raised 16 billion on the balance sheet, it says that to balance out the assets and liabilities, there's only a $4 billion difference. So even excluding the value of, of reserves, you have a $10 billion destruction of capital, which represents approximately 75% of the entire assets that the company had. So again, there's not a ton, but understanding the balance sheet is important. Go to the next page, if you would, and you're gonna see an uh, income statement. The income statement, again, they always compare periods. Remember I said that the balance sheet is a snapshot on a day. The income statement is a flow. So in 2019, you can see they generated 4.5 billion of revenue, 3.9 from whatever is in their marketing. To truly understand that, you need to read the financial statements. So you have 8.5 million billion of revenues. Then you go through the costs. You see their operating cost was 8.6. Hold on. So 2019, a year when oil averaged $55 a barrel and gas averaged $2.57 in MCF. Hold on. You're telling me that their revenues were $8.6 billion and their costs were $8.6 billion? So they actually generated zero income? How is that even possible? Okay, this is the difference between income and cash. So let's just quickly go through the operating expenses. Production, cash. Uh, transportation, cash. Severance, cash. Marketing, cash. Interestingly, you can mark off the $4 billion of marketing costs against the $3.9 billion of marketing gain. That's how you can see that the, the whole financial engineering of companies um, spinning out their midstream companies and the decision in 2007, 8, 9 to spin midstream organizations out and sell contracts to try and generate a gain. Their marketing was losing money, but it looked like they were making money. GNA, that's real. Obviously, cash. Depreciation. So, this is the non cash piece that's important to think about as we jump to the last piece of the financial statement, which is going to be on page. 60, sorry, 71. And 71, if you start with the net income, so that's just simply the, the revenues minus the expenses, and the expenses can be cash or non-cash. Now you add back the non-cash events. So their loss, as I said, was what, 8.6 billion in revenue, 8.6 billion in costs, roughly. So their loss was 300 million. You add back the non-cash of 2.3 billion, add back some non-cash tax benefits, some derivative settlements, some gains and losses, some accounts receivables, 
and you end up with, in 2019, Chesapeake generated $1.6 billion in operating cash flow. Now recall, the total debt was $9 billion. The total cash provided by operations was 1.6. That's not good. Next piece that's not good is under the cash flow from investing. How much did they spend to drill new wells to generate the cash provided by operations plus new wells? That's $2.5 billion. So in 2019, Chesapeake spent 900 million more than they generated in revenue. And you say, well, how did they do that? That doesn't make sense. Don't they have to balance things? Yes, and that's the next page, which is the cash flow from investing. And what you see is they raised $850 million of new, of new debt or equity or whatever, but new. And you can go through all the things they did last year. They took a new credit facility for 10.6. They paid back 10.1. They, they issued a new term loan of 1.5, blah, blah, blah. They raised $859 million. And so the important thing to take away from that was Chesapeake had $9 billion of debt. They generated $1.6 billion of operating cash flow spent 2.4, raised another 900 million, and did so by shuffling the decks on the, the chairs on the Titanic, but that short-term maturity that hit was what drove them into bankruptcy. And the reason that Chesapeake shares are trading at zero, zero, not trading, is because there is no value for the equity shareholders because only the debt will get paid and the debt will not make back what they loaned. And so, you know, Rose Hill went bankrupt this morning. They declared that their A shareholders, so their common equity will be wiped out. Now, Whiting went bankrupt about six weeks ago, and they said that the, the, the old equity holders get 3% of the new company. But my suspicion is there will be so many bankruptcies and the creditors are now mean as they should be, and they're hedge funds that want their money, and they're going to wipe out every single shareholder and make your shares worth zero. That is why you cannot invest in oil and gas companies right now, because they cannot survive their debt and their GNA and their interest long enough to be able to see higher prices. They will wipe out the equity, create new equity through bankruptcy. So what's Chesapeake doing? They're going through a restructuring where all of that debt I talked about is gonna be wiped out, gonna be converted at maybe 25 cents on the dollar. So if you gave $9 billion, you're gonna get 2.3 billion in new equity. And then the company's gonna have less debt, maybe $2 billion of debt. And then they're gonna come out and be public again. And now we have a new Chesapeake. But anyone who owned any shares in Chesapeake prior to this will be worth zero. So when I say that 95% of oil and gas companies are overvalued, and if you saw me speak any time in the last, in the six months prior to uh, February 27th, I said 95% of oil and gas companies are fundamentally overvalued. At oil at 40 and gas at $1.58, 100% of oil and gas companies are overvalued, 100%, and therefore their shares have to fall, and in many cases their shares will be worth zero. That is why you need to understand the financial statements and the income statement. Um, you can always email me at drw at hottakeoftheday.com if you want to learn more about this topic. Um, I do have a poll I wanted to put out on Chesapeake. Uh, let's go quick. How many people thought that Chesapeake would go bankrupt this year? So you have, I did for sure. I don't understand bankruptcy, so I had no opinion. And I didn't, which is... A perfectly valid answer. Okay. So um, I could do the same poll, uh, but I won't because they're one of our sponsors. But um, you will see uh, every single company that goes bankrupt has these issues way in advance. And the fact that COVID kind of hit in March and you're going bankrupt in June, bankruptcy doesn't happen over three months. Bankrupts happens over years. And so all of the companies going bankrupt now are like, oh, the, the COVID crisis really hurt us. No, shitty management, shitty debt management, 
not raising equity when prices were high, not selling assets when prices didn't make sense, and not drilling shitty on economic wells. We did all of those things. And so they're the first. So the people declaring bankruptcy now are just the worst run companies. The people who will declare bankruptcy in the next six to 12 months were bad and they were caught by not hedging and having too much debt. But only the companies that don't declare bankruptcy were actually planning for a rainy day. And that brings us back to Porter's Five Forces. You had a whole bunch of idiots with a lot of money spending on stupid wells and stupid land to grow production, to grow their way out of debt. And from a competitive force, that drove prices from 60 to 30 to negative 30 and now back to 40. And we have to live with that. That's why our industry is not great for companies. And that's why it's very hard to raise capital. So that is the financial statement. Hopefully, hopefully this is going well for everybody. Um, we have uh, covered two topics and we have 19 minutes to go. So I'm excited. Team building. Um, we're gonna do this really quick. The, I'm gonna say, this is an airport MBA book, but I really liked it. It's called The Five Dysfunctions of a Team. And um, I think the key, and, and if you think about your career and you think back to when relationships have broken down, it's dysfunction number one, which is an absence of trust. And this isn't trust like I'm happy to like loan you my credit card and you can go buy some office supplies and give it back to me and I know you won't use it. That's not trust. What trust is, is the trust in someone that they will do what they say they will do on time and that they will hold uh, a high standard of um, ethics and interaction. And so what I loved about this book was the way they described trust as if you're, if you're afraid to be vulnerable in front of your teammates, um, then you don't really have trust. And so I'll, I'll just say very quickly, the best exercise we did in our MBA, it was a team-based MBA. It was six people per team. We were all in 14 different cities. So you were with your cohort in your city. You did online learning long before this was a thing. And we did a trust exercise in the first two weeks when we were together. And as I recall, we had about an hour and each person spent about 10 minutes on their personal story. And there were some questions. It was like, what moment are you the most proud of? What moment was the most difficult in your life? And what do you want to accomplish? Something like that and you had 10 minutes. And the, the, the exercise got really intense because you would give your story and people talked about their kids. Some people had cancer in their family and some they lost someone and it was difficult to manage. And um, no word of a lie, the, the point of the exercise was the person who told the story would sit in their chair and the other team members would get on their knees in front of the person and they would have stickers and the stickers represented traits and they would put the sticker on literally like a bullseye that you had sitting in your lap. And then they would say, this sticker represents the way you deal with people based on the story of your dad and him, he died of cancer and you kept the family together. It, it shows me how, you know, that is such a core element of your personality. And every person did this like vulnerability exercise and our, our team, I mean, I'm a crier anyway, there's crying and hugging and all the dudes. And it was, it was, it was quite embarrassing. And when we came out of there, we found out that probably half the teams were like, this is bullshit. I don't want to do this. And what we found was of the teams that had problems during the MBA, either of students they couldn't hold accountable, didn't do their work, didn't submit things on time, dragged down the team, had infighting, every team that didn't take the exercise seriously ended up having some level of major, major issue. And the teams that did take it seriously found that they had built a level of vulnerability and trust in understanding that person truly, that they were able to relate to them in a better way. Now, I know that that's utopian and it's probably not practical in most organizations because sometimes there's just people you can't stand and you've broken relationships while you've worked together. And so doing the knee exercise is not going to fix things. But as you think about things going forward, it's that vulnerability and the true level of trust that allows you to build teams. And without that trust, then you don't have conflict. We should buy this, we should sell this. Well, okay, whatever you think, I don't care. And then if you don't fight, you don't have commitment to the answer. If you don't have commitment to the answer, no one holds anyone accountable. And if you don't have accountability, 
the whole thing falls apart because nobody gives a shit about results. And if we're honest, how many engineers, landmen, geologists, finance people went to their management over the last three years and said, what the fuck are we doing? We have no cash flow. We're drilling wells too close. We're putting out investor presentations that are total bullshit. We're lying. And instead of us using high prices to pay down debt and sell our company, Circa Al Walker, who looks like the smartest motherfucker on earth right now, doesn't he? And everyone else decided that they wouldn't listen to their team. They knew better. And it was because there wasn't trust. There wasn't conflict. And then everyone just said, screw it. I don't care. And that's how we ended up here. So um, I recommend the book. I kind of gave you a summary, but it's a really good book. Um, the other thing I want to talk about, and again, I'm going to do this case study. It's usually an hour and a half case study in MBA, but I'm going to do the case study in five minutes, which is going to really impress you. If you happen to do the pre-read that was um, um, the Carter Racing, uh, there's there's three elements to the Carter Racing. So the backstory, if you haven't read it, is there's this race, racing team. They're in debt. They have a race and they're trying to decide if they should race. And there's three potential options. Number one is they can withdraw, pay the fee, basically go bankrupt and they lose. Number two is they can race and the, the engine which has been having problems can, like there's a risk, they'll let the engine blow up and they lose the race and they don't get their sponsorship. Option three is they win, which means they get the prize money and uh, then they get a sponsorship, then they get their debt paid off. And so you have all this information and, and jumping ahead a little bit, but but I, I'd encourage you to read it. But here's the math. The math is the expected value of you competing ensures that you should compete. 50% of the time you're going to win when you do the expected value of the win, the loss, the cost, the engine blown, and you add it all up. Mathematically, you should compete. Now, the twist is that there's some correlation between the blown engine and temperature. And that the rough correlation, and you saw it in the case study in page one, sort of says, you know, between 45 degrees and 75 degrees, there's no correlation, but gaskets blow. And, and so you, you include that and you talk through it with your team. And, and in almost all cases, the teams come up with, yeah, 100% we should race. And, you know, the people who are against it, they're like, you're soft. You just care about safety. Like, there's no real cost. Like, shut up. And so group think really starts to, to come into factor. And, and again, I tie this to the coronavirus. I think depending on your friend group and depending on your political persuasion, there is a lot of group think that someone who's anti shutdown will raise a whole bunch of data. And one of their friends out with eight people will be like, yeah, but I mean, like, are we protecting the elderly? And they're like, who fucking cares about the elderly? I mean, they had a great life. I'm caring about my kids. Shut up. And ultimately, like in 12 Angry Men, which is a great 45-minute movie that I also recommend you watch. It's on YouTube. It's free. It's phenomenal. But the, the jury, and in this case, the people discussing, convince the person they come along. Well, then they give you one more piece of information at the end, which is this, if I can change. Um, and, and what it shows is this is the races they finished out of the 28 races they finished and the seven that they failed in, here were the races they finished and the number of um, uh, like number of races they finished in the temperature. And the mechanic is saying, you know, man, my gut just tells me we really shouldn't run. I, I don't know, I know there's not a relationship with temperature, but there is, and I can't prove it, but I feel it. And the group goes through and, and they look at this information and there's 10 minutes left to race. You have three minutes to come up with a decision and 75% of teams or so decide to race. Now, what it turns out is that the Carter Racing case study is actually the Challenger, uh, the NASA spaceship from 1987. And the data is exactly the same and it was a gasket. And this last slide that I'm showing you here shows that there was a 0% probability that under 65 degree ambient temperature that they would finish the race. And in this case, finish the race meant there would be a failure, which meant that the ship would blow up. And so unfortunately, they didn't have this data analyzed in this way until just before the launch. And everything that they had looked at was on the previous where there wasn't a definitive correlation between temperature and number of failures. 
They weren't looking at, did we ever finish a race when it was 65? And the morning the Challenger launched, it was 40 degrees Fahrenheit. And as everyone knows, if you're as old as me, they launched and 73 seconds into the flight, the Challenger exploded. Now, there's a whole bunch of great learnings from this, but the two pieces that I wanna tie back to today and why I think it's so important from a team building, if you have a team that you trust, and then if you truly trust that mechanic and they are your expert and you've worked with them forever, and even if they're wrong, you know that uh, they're giving their absolute best technical advice, the best leaders listen. And the best leaders change their mind in, in the face of new data. And so as we think about our companies, as we think about oil at 40 versus 20 versus 60, Exxon coming out and saying, we're a 25 year business. We have a long-term plan. We're just keeping the ship going. Is that really what you want from leadership? Or do you want leadership to acknowledge that things change, there's new data every day and you need to incorporate new data? And so I would say in COVID, I'm not sure that all the politicians have incorporated all of the data on either side and that people continue to go back to that original narrative and to tie back to the gorilla. There's a gorilla walking right across the screen and people are only looking at the number of passes that are being shared between people and they're not paying attention to the larger issue of trade-offs. And so when you're thinking about building a team, when you're thinking about financial statements and, and business execution, and when you're thinking about trade-off, there's no such thing as black and white. And it's why the number one lesson in your MBA is it depends. And it always depends and it depends on new data. And if you have a strong team that listens to people and you have leaders who are willing to accept a, a responsibility when things go bad and, and give the credit when things go well, that's an organization you wanna be part of and that's an organization that's gonna be successful. So um, that is the piece on team building. A couple books, hopefully that was helpful to you. Do I have another poll coming? I don't think that I do, excellent. So let's go to the final subject that I can cover in eight minutes, uh, which is a business plan. And I'm sure some of you are still employed, some of you are starting to think about your side hustle, uh, some of you are thinking about like what what's next for me if energy if TRW is right that 80% of jobs and 80% of companies are going away for the reasons I've described on the financial statements like what am I going to do I should build a business plan and I should have a PowerPoint that tells people what my business plan is and why I'm differentiated and now I know all about Porter's by forces so I'm going to put a slide in on that I'm going to talk about that I know all about team building and I'm going to show people the gorilla and people are really going to understand that I have the best team in the world. I have the best idea in the world. I'm the smartest person in the world. Everyone loves me. Just give me your money and I will make you money. And I'm here to say, and so this is the learning of the book. And I didn't really talk about the thing that, that uh, has really launched me into Hot Take of the Day was One Energy Partners. Some of you may have never even heard of it. You're like the Hot Take of the Day guy does podcasts and, and blogs. Like I don't know anything about them. Well, in 2016, we got funded for $75 million by Carnelian Energy Capital to start One Energy Partners. And our business plan was that we had three buckets. We had distressed assets. It was 2016, we were coming out of bankruptcy. Banks were gonna take assets. It was a horrible time. So you could go and be a new management team that had some capital. You'd go talk to the banks and say, I know you don't want this asset, but we want this asset. So we'll buy it from you for a discount. We'll fix it and we'll sell it. It's a great idea and everyone loves that idea, but it's very, 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 very hard to make money because the banks have a hundred cent mark and the assets worth 20 cents and they're not going to sell it for 20 cents because they're better off to just ride it to zero. So that was bucket number one. Bucket number two was we were going to do JVs to bring capital to ideas that should be developed in 2016 to test exploration concepts and that it was an access for new capital. That didn't work either. And bucket three was, we'll just do some operations just like everybody else, but we don't wanna be in the Permian because the Permian is too expensive, it's too hard, everyone knows about it, we wanna differentiate our skill set. So we had this business plan, we had this team, um, we had this pitch deck, and at the end of the day, we got funded. So we were, we were super excited. Well, the plan that we ended up implementing was we were an operator in the Permian Basin, in the most expensive basin, buying raw land that we then drilled and sold in 2018. And the reason I tell that story is because 
the business plan had nothing to do with the reality of what the market was. Bucket one was not possible because no banks were selling. And so for us to have just stuck with that business plan, we were, gonna, we were never going to deploy. Option two was people wanted farm outs, but they, they thought their asset was worth what it was in 2014, so no one wanted to sell it. And so within about three months, we'd exhausted every meeting you possibly could and found out that neither bucket one or bucket two was going to work. Now, what I learned when I wrote this in my first startup in 2012, we, had, we paid ourselves salaries, we got offices, we had software, we had travel budgets, we had a board that we paid and all that money that was raised from friends and family to present our business plan to a real funder, we lost all of it. And so I lost about half a million dollars of my, my best friend's family money and my money and my, my parents' money and my sister's money. Um, and the learning that I had was there was everyone who gives you advice on business plans is wrong. Number one, don't spend money on things that you don't need to spend money on. So salaries are stupid. If you're starting up a business, don't waste money paying yourself. If you truly need to pay someone to do something, be very specific about a consulting role for a website or a something. Don't throw money at problems because you're never going to get it back on the back end. Expenses, offices, cars, um, advertising material, don't spend it on that. Number three, no matter what your plan is, the second it's written, it's going to be totally torn up and you're going to go a totally different way. And that's the story of One Energy. If you had told us in 2016 that we would drill five wells in the Permian, buy 12,000 acres, break the asset up into four pieces, sell it over the course of time in the only window in the last six years that the A&D market existed in some sort of a bull market from 2016 to 18. And if we had the asset now, I mean, it's drill your returns because there's no asset market to sell. None of that was part of our business plan. That was called looking at the data, realizing the market was changing, realizing that $73 oil, you know, for a lot of reasons probably was about the peak, realizing there was no new entrance and breaking the asset up. So that's the creativity. And don't build a seven-wheeled car that nobody wants to buy because at the end of the day, you need to sell something. And then the other thing is 99 times in 100, your startup will fail. And so it's all well and good to say, I want to start an oil and gas company. I think I can do it better. If you just give me money, I will do better. There are, for every one energy, there are 99 not one energies that did not have an exit and are now in purgatory. And so in the book, there's a chapter called What You Need to Know About Money and the Laggers. And I talk about private equity purgatory. And then there's a chapter called If You Have to Pick Up the Phone More Than run Once to Raise Money, You Shouldn't Be Raising Money. Those are two of the biggest learnings that I got out of starting a business. And so um, if you end up reading the book, uh, sure appreciate it. And uh, you'll learn a lot more about where all these things came from. So with that being said, I think I actually just did an MBA in an hour, didn't I? I I'm pretty sure. Okay. I, I have no doubt everybody will receive some sort of diploma or certificate, but really appreciate everybody's attendance. Um, look forward to the rest of the summer and also look forward to brick and mortar doing these luncheons again in person. Hope everybody has a wonderful day and thanks.